been waiting to get the release on, and we're so excited uh, as they'll be performing that surgery, I believe, in Richmond, right? And so uh, be in prayer for her leading up to that. Again, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to John's Gospel, Chapter 2? Please remember next week again, we're going to be across the way. I'm going to keep reminding you and keep reminding me. That's a big day. Be in prayer uh, for it. But as you're turning to John uh, chapter 2, you know, if you've been around me, you know I have a, uh, a good sense of humor. I can laugh at myself. I guess you, you have to be able to laugh at yourself. But I love funny things. And I remember years ago, the funniest sign I ever personally saw. It was so funny, I should have submitted it to Reader's Digest uh, when they were doing stories, funny stories like that. But it was when Karen and I were in Fort Worth, Texas. I was at a seminary. And that particular day, I was just riding south of the cemetery, uh, seminary rather, not cemetery. <laughs> seminary, heading down James Avenue. And I looked and I saw a business. It was a hairstyling business. And outside of the business, uh, it had the name of the hairstyling business. There was a sign, and beneath that was the quote, we can make you beautiful. But what was funny was not that, but it was a temporary sign that was below it posted in red letters, help wanted. And I thought that was just, it just tickled me. That's a true story. But you know, signs are a part of our lives. When we leave here, if you're driving, you'll see a number of signs. It's very interesting in the day of GPS and advanced technology, signs have not been outdated. I was thinking this past week, advanced technology is outdating a lot of things like the printed news press. Yet in spite of the fact that you have that GPS on your phone, you'll travel in any city, any locality, and you'll still find signs. They decorate the roadside like a well-lit Christmas tree. But you know, there's one thing that is true about a sign, and it's this, it's not about the sign. It may look nice, but it is pointing beyond itself. It may give you information about a business. It may give you direction about where a city might be. Uh, for instance, a sign may say, this business does hair, or that city is 10 miles ahead, or this right will lead you to this particular street. But simply put, a sign gives information or truth that is beyond itself. And so as we look at John's gospel, when we're looking at the first three chapters, the gospel of John includes many miracles, the first of which we're going to see today from Jesus' public ministry. But actually, these miracles might more accurately be called signs because the miracles were not just some spectacle. They were not some sideshow, but they actually were serving a purpose beyond themselves. You might say a sign, biblically speaking, is a miracle with a message. Look with me at John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. What does that have to do with you and me, woman? Jesus asked, my hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Now six stone water jars have been set there for Jewish purification, each containing 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them, so they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter, and they did. When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first, then after people ha have drunk much, the inferior, but you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in, the, in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum together with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. And they stayed only a few days. Let us pray. Father, as we look to your word today, we thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, um, for the miracles, Lord, that Jesus performed each one having a specific intent 
to lead people to believe and to point people to even greater spiritual truths. Lord, open our eyes as we study it this Mother's Day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 11 again tells us that this was the first miracle Jesus performed publicly, and it occurred at a public event, a wedding event. Now, the wedding event among the Jews was much different from our weddings. Our weddings uh, sometimes maybe last an hour. Maybe there, there may be a Friday evening and a Saturday, but in the Jewish wedding, actually there would be a feast that would last a week or even longer. And this particular feast uh, and wedding uh, was carried out in a town called Cana of Galilee, about six miles northeast of where Jesus was was born in Nazareth. And we might say of Cana, it was a small town that had a big happening that day. This morning, I want to look at the spiritual truth uh, that this expresses. And in that sense, it's a sign. It points beyond historically what happened here, beyond a momentary miracle to a deep spiritual truth that hopefully we'll grasp this morning. But before we do that, I want to look at a couple of things that may be uh, misconceptions people may have in regarding this text. And the first is this, Jesus' relationship to his mother. You know, Jesus considered it, or John rather, considered it important to include the fact that Jesus' mother was at this particular wedding event. And Jesus' mother, Mary, actually came to him with a request in a form of a statement. And we see it in verse three. It says, when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him they don't have any wine. In other words, the jars were empty, um, but they had run out of uh, supply before they ran out of the event. And this could be very embarrassing for uh, the wedding feast host. And as we think about Mary, I wonder here, did Mary know that Jesus could do something about it? Most certainly, she did. She knew that Jesus could do something about it. And so we see in verse 4, though Jesus responds to her, what does that have to do with you and me, woman? Now, on this Mother's Day, I think there's something that needs to be really clear Jesus was not disrespecting his mother today. You know, a lot of times we'll say, what do you think, woman? And we'll do that. And it can be in our culture uh, a statement of disrespect. But we need to be very careful when we read the Bible that we don't impose our own desires, our own thoughts, our own culture on what is described biblically. For instance, we can dangerously... Um, impose our thought on the inflection of Jesus' voice. That he said, woman, what do I have to do with you? Well, that's reading into, not reading out of what is said there. And we can impose sometimes our usage of the word on that particular culture, and that's wrong too. In fact, the use of the word woman was not a derogatory term. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, when Jesus was on the cross, there was John the disciple and there was Mary, his mother. And as Jesus looked at the disciple, he pointed to the disciple with deep care, honoring his mother, respecting his mother. And he said to Mary, woman, behold your son. In other words, what he was saying is to his mother, woman, this is the one who will take care of your needs physically as I am dying. And so we see in that particular setting, that term was not a derogatory term. It was actually a term used in honor. So a lot of times we, we can dangerously interpret scripture and try to impose our culture, our inflection, and really misunderstand what it's saying. So what is Jesus really saying when his mother comes to him and he says, my hour has not yet come? Uh, is he being disrespectfully? disrespectful. No, he wasn't. But he was saying this, and it's important. Even though Mary was his earthly mother, Jesus was Lord to Mary. He was Lord to Mary. He's Lord to all of us, and he's not subject to our untimely request. To think, I, I think this is really a, a gentle correction that Jesus tried to say, basically, mom, I'm Lord, I'm in control. Nothing is taking me by surprise. Uh, 
But then I want you to look at a second aspect, and this is concerning Jesus and the water changed to wine. Wine is a fermented beverage. We know the scripture says here that wine here was good. In fact, it was great in quality. But while it's true that Jesus transformed the water to wine, it's wrong to make judgment through this that Jesus endorses the consumption of alcohol. It certainly does not endorse excessive consumption of alcohol. These were large containers with many gallons. <laughs> And we face a danger when we read the scripture and we take a narrative portion of scripture, a descriptive portion of scripture and try to prescribe, make it prescriptive. People will say, well, Jesus made a whole lot of wine. It must have been a big party. I'm going to drink a lot. That's wrong. It's not true. But it's also wrong to impose all of our thoughts. The scripture teaches really two things in regard to alcohol, I believe, that are clear teaching. One is do not excessively use alcohol, all right? We studied in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. It says, be ye not drunk with wine, uh, which leads to excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can all attest to the fact that it is wrong to excessively consume alcohol. But it doesn't speak clearly against a controlled or moderate use. Now, I totally abstain from drinking alcohol. I've not drank a taste all the years that I've been a pastor. That's a personal choice because I think there's another clear directive in Scripture, and it's this. My freedom should not impose or infringe or hurt another believer or unbeliever's life. That's why I choose not to, to do that. I, I don't judge anyone. I don't stand in judgment of anyone. But as a pastor, it's something that I've been willing to, to give up. All right. And, and I like Dr. Pepper pretty good, too. Um, but uh, but years ago, um, I had a dear friend who struggled with alcoholism and God freed him from it. And he married later in life. And that woman began to introduce alcohol in the home. My friend actually died as a result of an accident, drunk driving. He had been freed from it, but she brought it back in and led to his demise. There, there's a, a verse in scripture, two verses in Romans 15, verses two and three. It says, everyone should please his neighbor. You say, oh, that doesn't sound right. Am I to be a people pleaser? No, that's not the end of it. Everyone should please his neighbor for his own good to build him up, for even Christ did not please himself. In other words, Christ sacrificed for the well-being of a brother. Now, when it comes to alcohol, uh, I'm not your conscience, the Holy Spirit leads, but I can tell you the excessive use of it is wrong, but God gives forgiveness, all right? And the second aspect is, even though I have that freedom, I need to be responsible with that freedom. If in, in the spirit of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, if I'm in the company of people that it may be a stumbling block to, or if someone has struggled with it, then I might, of my own choice, give up that freedom for the sake of my brother, that I might not offend or cause that brother to stumble. And so as we look at that, we see the issue of the mother and how Jesus uh, uh, interacted with his mother Mary. We see the issue of alcohol, that we need to be careful not to use narratives to impose uh, that these are direct teachings of Scripture. We need to understand those things. But in light of that, let's look at what this miracle speaks to us spiritually. In his three years of public ministry, this is the first recorded. And I believe that is significant. I don't believe it's coincidence because this miracle is a most special miracle. Not that any of the others aren't. You see, Jesus performed a lot of various miracles. In John chapter 11, he performed a miracle of resuscitation. He revived Lazarus, who had been dead for a number of days. That was not a resurrection because Lazarus would die again. It was a miraculous resuscitation. In John 6, he performed a miracle of multiplication. He fed the multitudes with a few lo loaves and a few fish. In John 9, he performed a miracle of restoration, giving sight to someone who had eyes but couldn't see. In, in John chapter 6, he performed what I call a miracle of degravitation. That is, he walked on water. But then there's this miracle in John 2. 
the first miracle of Jesus' public ministry. It was not a miracle of resuscitation or multiplication, not a miracle of gravitation, degravitation or restoration. It was a miracle of what? Transformation. He took one thing, water, and he made it into another thing, wine. And not only was it a miracle of a change, but it tells us that the change went from something that was okay to something that was much better. He took water, changed it to wine, made water pots, wine pots, same container, different contents. Now, I don't believe it's coincidence that this happened to be the first miracle publicly recorded in Scripture. You say, why is that? Because Jesus came, not that the miracles would be some sideshow, but he came that the miracles would be a sign pointing to a greater spiritual truth. And where better to start than changing the water to wine in transformation? In other words, Jesus at the very beginning came with this purpose to change hearts, to change lives. And physically, he changed the water to wine. And it's a picture spiritually of what he'll do in an individual's life. I want to briefly note four things true of the situation that I believe pictures spiritual transformation, the person who would believe in Jesus Christ. First, I want you to note with me, the change here was an inward change. Look at verse seven. He says, fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. There was an inward change because then he follows, he says in verse eight, now draw some out and take it to the head water, waiter rather. So it was the same water jars, but different substance inside. And Jesus, when he spoke to the religious leaders who were so concerned about how they looked outwardly, they tried to follow every single regulation, every single rule. They were focused on it. And Jesus, time after time, issued indictments in Matthew 23 as he was talking to them. You're whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inwardly you're, you're full of dead bones. And he says, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but you don't clean the inside. And so his judgment against them is all you're concerned with is outward confirmation, uh, uh, being conformed, not being transformed. And so we see that inside these leaders were wrong with God. They were not in right standing. Listen, what you need today is not some outward conformation to things. You need an inward transformation. Jesus can bring it in your life. Even as he changed the water into something that was much better, wine, so he can change your life from the inside out. And that leads to the second truth. Jesus himself was the agent of the change. Mary was, had her timing wrong, but her idea was right. Jesus could fix the situation. It's very interesting. Look at what it says there. Um, it said in verse 8, after they filled the waters with, jaw, with water, he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. In verse 9, when the head waiter tasted the water, he didn't know where it came from. He's saying, what is this? The best is the last. In other words, Jesus spoke and the water changed to wine. You know, there is power in Jesus' word. He didn't say, let me doctor this. Let me get my hands in on this. Let me add something to it. He didn't even say, let me pray. He just spoke it and it changed. And God spoke the world into creation. He spoke this world into creation. Everything we have, this uh, uh, lectern that is before me, which is not a podium, a podium you stand on, a lectern you stand behind. This lectern that is in front of me, it was made from something, from something, all right? God just spoke the world into creation. And you know what? He's going to speak the conclusion of it. 
Even as sure as we stand here, Jesus, when he comes back, there's the picture of riding the white horse and the sword coming out of his mouth. There's no mention of anybody who's with him, which will be the saints who are with him, having to lift anything. Why is that? Because he will speak the word and it will happen. Jesus said, take it. And it was changed. Do you realize that Jesus possesses the power and the authority to transform your life? The one who spoke this world into creation has the power to make you a new person in Christ. It tells us if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things become new. The old water became the new wine, and Jesus was the agent. But let's look at the third thing, and I love this. The latter state was far superior to the former. The head waiter, when he tasted the water, he didn't know where it came from after it had become wine. And so he said this, you know, everyone sets out the good wine first and then the bad. Now, you know, people drink a lot and maybe they're not using as much discretion after they've and taking a lot in. Maybe some people were going to leave the feast early. You wanted to make a good first impression. We don't know all of that. We do know this, that typically in that setting, the best came out first and the worst came last. Now listen, this is the first miracle of Jesus. And what does it say? The end is better than the beginning. The latter is better than than the former. Listen to what Paul writes about the Christian life. He says, but everything that was a gain to me before Jesus transformed me in my former life, I consider that a loss because of Christ. I consider everything to be rubbish in view of what? The surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're living the best life. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, there is a better life. The latter can be better than the former. Wouldn't you trust in him today? The latter life for the believer is greater than the former. But I want you to see a fourth thing. People noticed the difference in the quality. As we say, or saw rather the head waiter noticed the qualitative difference. He noticed there was a difference in the substance. You know, there are two parts to every testimony. There's the verbal part, and we have talked about that. Many of you have shared your testimony, and we need a verbal witness. We talked about the parts of the verbal witness. My life before Christ, which we see is not as great, how I came to know Christ, and how Christ makes my life greater. Those three aspects of the testimony. And and I pray that you're considering that and working on that to share. But there's also a second part to our testimony, and that's a lifestyle witness. Now, sometimes I will be honest, I hesitate to just say lifestyle witness because some people say, I'll just be a good person and I won't ever have to speak Jesus. Well, that's not accurate. We need to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. We need to be ready to give reason. We need to verbalize our faith in Christ. But people also need to see a difference, a qualitative difference in our life. So when the head waiter looked at this wine, not only was he comparing it to the water, but he says, the wine that I've seen before, uh, this is something. There's something different here. There's something better here. And when people look at us as believers who have been transformed by the power of Christ, the grace of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, they should see something different. Does your life draw people to Christ? Do people look at you and say, qualitatively, that's a different life. That's something that's not normal. Listen, there is a powerful witness in a transformed life. Wives, on this Mother's Day, Peter wrote this, be subject to your own husbands. It says, don't nag or complain so that even if some do not obey the word, if they're not ready to become Christians, 
They may be won what? By arguing with them? By going against them? No. They will, will be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. That's 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2. What is that saying? If you're a spouse, if you're a wife and you have an unbelieving spouse, there is a power in living the Christian life before your husband. There's a power in it. Now, he may not say, boy, that's a real power, but they're observing the power of a transformed life. How about the disciples in Acts 4, verse 13, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were what? Great, sophisticated, well-spoken men? No, unlearned men. They were amazed and recognized they had been with Jesus. They, they saw them and they said, there's something there's something different. Listen, believers, don't be weighted down in this life that you're living. Live the transformed life. Pray, God, use me as a witness. God, may I be a light. May I be a light in my workplace. May I be a light in the home. May I, may I be a light wherever I am. Allow your life to shine. You know, Next week is a big week. I would say next to Christmas and, and right there with Easter, I would put Christmas and Easter. Beginning next Sunday is probably the biggest week in the life of our church. We have two big outreach events. Next Sunday morning, people gathered to hear the word of God, to hear testimony, to hear music. And Saturday night, following that up six days later and being able to interact into fellowship with people who hopefully have come out Sunday and others who may have not. We have a story to tell. John recorded the story, but somehow I don't think he was the only one. I think Mary had a story to tell. That head waiter had a story to tell. Those who were in attendance was a story to tell. And you know what it, the common denominator of all of it was, is Jesus. He takes what's okay and he totally changes it into something outstanding. We have a story to tell, the transforming work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we have uh, looked at this narrative from the New Testament, Jesus' first public miracle. Lord, a sign to us that the same voice that transformed water into wine can transform a self-absorbed, <coughs> directionless life into a powerful, victorious, and joyful life. Lord Jesus, you're worthy because you're the one who does it. Father, all too often we try to dress up ourselves. We try to conform outwardly when we just need to be transformed and live in the power of your transforming work. And we give this prayer and lift it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our candidates for